I would like to introduce Dr. Ben Badias. Um, he'll be our presenter for tonight. My name is Salim Ben Badis. I'm a full-time epilepsy uh, specialist in Florida. Uh, and one of the areas of interest for an epileptologist are psychogenic seizures. The topic was chosen by Laura, by the way, not by me. But it is one of my favorite topics, and it really is very important because we deal with this on a regular basis. So here is a seizure. And that is a typical quote, grand mal seizure, tonic, clonic convulsion. There are many characteristics of this. If you've seen enough of them, they pretty much look the same. Tonic phase, clonic phase, and then post phase. And because they look so stereotyped, I'll show you things that superficially look like seizures but are not. And so our job, of course, is to distinguish one from the other. So here is another episode that is not an epileptic seizure. And that is psychogenic. So you can see that superficially, superficially they resemble each other in reality, they really don't, and I will explain the differences. So psychogenic seizures are very common. They are the most well-known, the most studied psychogenic symptom, but they are psychogenic just about anything. Uh, any name your symptom, they can be psychogenic as well. But psychogenic seizures are the most often studied because they are well known and they are identifiable. We can actually make a diagnosis of psychogenic seizures or episodes, whereas psychogenic other symptoms, it's a little bit more difficult. They don't have an equivalent of EEG video monitoring. So we're going to talk about all this, psychogenic seizures, other psychogenic symptoms in neurology, briefly touch base on other symptoms in medicine, and then we'll talk about the psychiatric psychological aspects. So this is very common. Psychogenic seizures are extremely common. It's about a third of patients that present to an epilepsy center for intractable seizures. So at any time in our center, we have a five bed monitoring unit at any time there is one or two patients in there, and it's the case right now, uh, with psychogenic seizures. So this is very, very common, mostly young adults and slightly more women than men. The terminology is a problem, and this has been debated in the literature, by the way, my email address I will show at the end, and if you want any of these articles that I cite or show you, by all means, send me an email and I will send you the article. So these are a couple of articles where we discuss the terminology. My position on this is that th there are many terms for this, but I think the term seizure is confusing to patients and to caregivers, and that's why the title of this letter that you can see at the bottom uh, is titled functional seizures. So I still have seizures, right? Because if you keep using the word seizures, patients and families are confused. So I don't recommend terms that include the term seizures in them. That's an entire debate. So here you see different terminology, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, psychogenic non-epileptic attacks, non-epileptic seizures, functional seizures the, is the one that people like. I don't mind the functional, but I do mind the presence of the word seizure. I also don't like NES, non-epileptic, because as I will show you, non-epileptic does not necessarily mean psychogenic. We need the P in there. Not everything that is not epileptic is psychogenic. I'll show you a few examples. So psychogenic, yes. Non-epileptic, yes. Not the word seizure, in my opinion. Like I said, not, not everything that's not epileptic is psychogenic. In a monitoring unit, as I said, the majority of patients misdiagnosed as epilepsy do have psychogenic episodes, but syncope, migraines, TIA, sleep disorders, other things can be mistaken for seizures also. And I'll show you a few examples. So like I said, it's about a third of patients sent to an epilepsy center. One of the reasons why patients are misdiagnosed with epilepsy is this, which is an entirely separate topic of its own, but it's related to this. Many patients who receive a wrong diagnosis of epilepsy, most of them have psychogenic episodes, 
the diagnosis is based on a so-called abnormal EEG that wasn't really abnormal, but it was misread. So there is a problem with overreading of EEG. We published a few articles of this. So my point is just because somebody says their EEG showed epilepsy doesn't mean it's true. EEGs are frequently overread by neurologists who do not specialize in EEG and epilepsy. Here I just showed you three articles that we analyzed that, that issue, but that's a very, very important problem. So another myth that is very common, and you will hear that all the time, is that, well, many patients with psychogenic episodes also have epilepsy anyway. That is not true. Uh, the truth is that about 10% of them do. So 10% of people with psychogenic seizures also have epilepsy. So it's not common, but those are painful and difficult to manage because when they call and report seizures, you have to determine which kind is it, type A, psychogenic, or type B, epileptic. And so you really have to educate the family uh, about how to identify each uh, of them. So this is one of our study many years ago that confirmed that it's only about 10%, it was 9.4 in this study, of patients with definite psychogenic episodes who also have evidence for epilepsy. In theory, psychogenic episodes can mimic any type of seizures. Most commonly and most dramatically, they mimic grand mal seizures, like the two episodes I showed you at the beginning, or at least motor seizures, shaking, jerking uh, of the entire body or one limb or two limbs, just like I showed you at the beginning. They can also mimic staring or unresponsive seizures, and occasionally they can mimic milder episodes. When you take a history and you talk to the patients, these are things that argue in favor of epileptic seizures. The episodes are stereotyped, meaning they all are similar to one another for a given patient. Incontinence, urinary or fecal, occurrence out of sleep, and injury. When patients report injuries, you have to be careful, that's usually epileptic, including tongue lacerations like this. So this is almost diagnostic of an epileptic seizure. You do not see this with psychogenic episodes. On the other hand, when you take a history, you talk to the patients and the family, what are things that should raise concern and, and raise red flags that maybe this is psychogenic rather than epileptic? Odd precipitance, pain, noise, emotions, getting upset. And the classic one is in the doctor's office. When patients have an episode in the waiting room or in the doctor's office, it's more likely to be psychogenic than epileptic. High frequency, uh, not touched by any number of seizure medications. Coexistent psychiatric diagnoses. That's not sufficient, of course, but that is a red flag. Major depression, bipolar, uh, etc. Mania. Demeanor, social history, the level of concern of the patient. Is it appropriate for the situation? Vague diagnoses like fibromyalgia or unexplained chronic pain and a review of system with multiple symptoms and multiple complaints. These are all things that suggest, they don't make a diagnosis, of course, but they raise, they should raise your suspicion. Okay, so, so this is uh, one study we did showing the value of chronic pain, fibromyalgia, uh, or a, uh, a spell in the clinic that predicts a diagnosis of psychogenic episodes. This is an illustration of what I said a florid review of system where the patient has 20 some symptoms listed on a paper. Those are things that suggest somatizations. What about the episodes themselves? So that's a little trickier because for the most part, this is only by history and history is not all that reliable. So this is more applicable to EEG video. And I'm sure I'm going to show you a video of all of this. But this is also applicable to a new thing recently that has become very helpful, and that is cell phone videos brought by the family or the loved ones of the seizures in question. And we get to review those. They are incredibly helpful. I like to say every patient owns half an epilepsy monitoring unit. It's called a cell phone. So you should encourage patient families and loved ones to take videos. It's much better than the description of non-professionals. Let me see the video uh, of the seizure and it's really helpful. So these are things we look for and you'll show them, you'll see them on video. Slow onset, interrupted, stop and go as we call it. 
arrhythmic and asynchronous between the two sides, as opposed to synchronous, which is what an epileptic seizure does. There are specific behaviors that are very common in psychogenic episodes and very rare in epileptic seizures, so they're useful. Pelvic thrusting, side-to-side -side head shaking like this, rolling over from supine to prone, weeping, stuttering, eyes closed for the entire episode, back arching or opistotonic posturing, and bilateral shaking with preserved awareness and responsiveness. All of those things are highly suggestive of psychogenic episodes, and you will see all that on the video. I will point out that none of these specific behaviors is 100% specific, but each of them is 80 to 90% specific, and many patients, as you will see shortly, have many of them, not just one. So this is an example of back arching or opistotonic posturing. That is very highly specific for psychogenic episodes. I've never seen that in an epileptic seizure. Icto eye closure, the eyes close for the entire episode. That just does not happen in epileptic seizures. Eyes are usually blinking. They're not shut for the entire episode. So here are illustrations of all of that. Asynchrony, rolling over, flapping, slapping, non-tonic, non-clonic, bicycling, asynchrony between left and right, eyes closed, this is more of a combative behavior. It's not tonic, not clonic, not myoclonic. It's multi-directional, side-to-side -side head shaking. You will see several other times. That's very, very specific for psychogenic episodes. Slapping, flapping movements, non-tonic, non-clonic, bicycling, asynchrony. Very good bicycling and side-to-side -side head shaking. Same thing, but faster. This is synchronous, but it's still not tonic or clonic. I don't know what to call this, but it's not a seizure. Here you see the eyes closed for the entire time, non-tonic, non-clonic, and stop and go, kind of sl slows down. This is the same lady as the picture of the back arching. Eyes closed and look at the change in rhythm. Seizures don't do that. Faster, slower, faster, slower. This is an example of pelvic thrusting, a very good one. And this is a good example of back arching and violent. Behavior. So you can see it can be uh, pretty dramatic. One thing we can do sometimes is induction or activation where we can trigger an episode with some sort of placebo maneuver that can be an IV saline. We don't use that anymore. Some people think it's unethical, uh, but we can use non-invasive methods like a tuning fork, like uh, some people use an alcohol pad. And as long as you are suggesting to the patient that it might trigger an attack, it might. Uh, the usefulness of this is that it's very specific. Obviously, if I trigger an episode with an alcohol pad or a tuning fork on the forehead, it's not a seizure. So it's very likely to be psychogenic. IV, like I said, uh, we don't use anymore because it's unnecessarily invasive. The good news, as we published in this paper many years ago, is that you can do activation induction without using anything suspicious. You can just use hyperventilation, photic stimulation, and verbal suggestion, coaching. And those are regularly done during EEG, so they don't raise suspicion and they are ethical. And that's what we do. We don't use any of the placebos anymore. If we have a suspicion, and let's say the patient is in the monitoring unit for three days, nothing has happened, we will do an induction with hyperventilation, photic stimulation, verbal suggestion. And if it triggers an episode, it can be very, very useful. The other advantage of doing inductions, there are pros and cons to induction. Some people object to them and it's a worthwhile debate. But the other advantages are when the patient doesn't have a spontaneous episode. Sometimes people come to the hospital, to the monitoring unit, they're relaxing, laying in bed, getting served breakfast, lunch, and dinner, not at home with the stress of work and the kids, and they don't have anything. So for people who have infrequent events, it can turn 
an evaluation where I could be unable to conclude to something conclusive with an episode triggered by activation. So we use it when needed. Uh, the argument against using induction is that's unethical because we are deceiving the patient. And yes, there is an element of non-disclosure, but in my view, uh, which can be debated, it is worth it as opposed to perpetuating a diagnosis for years, taking seizure medications. And now that it can be done without using a placebo, I think the objections against induction have become weaker. But it's debated. This was a debate a few years ago between the yes side, which is my side, and the no side of somebody who is obviously misguided. I'm just kidding. It's a worthwhile debate. Another advantage of induction, by the way, shown here, is that you can do this during a short EEG. Instead of admitting a patient for four days in an epilepsy monitoring unit, you can do a one-hour outpatient EEG video, and if the patient produces an episode with induction, you're done. You're, if, as long as you make sure it's the episode in question and so forth. So it's very cost effective. And especially nowadays that people aren't crazy about coming to the hospital. I don't think people should ever be crazy about coming to the hospital. But this is something that can be done as an outpatient. Okay. So when we do EEG video to capture episode, that is the gold standard. For us, I always like to say EEG videos for the epilepsy specialist is like the skin biopsy for the dermatologist, right? It will tell me everything. It's a biopsy of your seizures. Give me a good video, give me a good EEG during the episode and I'm all good. I can reach a conclusion. But they are, you know, there are uh, difficulties sometimes with EEG video. It's a very reliable test. One of the misconceptions you will hear from people who don't know much about epilepsy, including mental health people, is that we make a diagnosis by just looking at an episode. The EEG doesn't show seizure during the episode, therefore it's psychogenic. Not true, and I'll show you an example. That is not how it works. It's a little more subtle than that because we know there are seizures, the epileptic seizures, that will not show up on the EEG. We know that. So here is how it really works. We record the episode, but I added the word habitual. This is critical. You have to make sure the episode we recorded is the episode in question, not something different. Number two, yes, you have to have absence of a nictal EEG pattern, great, but the episode clinically, meaning the video, also has to be not a type that we know can come without EEG changes. I will show you what I mean by that. And with that, you can conclude that the recorded episode, notice recorded, only what you recorded, you can conclude, is non-epileptic by itself. The normal EEG during the episode does not tell you it's psychogenic. It tells you it's not epileptic. There is a difference. What tells you that it's psychogenic is the phenomenology of the episode, what you just saw on video. So what I was alluding to is that there are seizures. They used to be called simple partial seizures. Some of them are called auras that we know if you put an EEG recording during the seizure, the seizure is so small and so limited, it will not show up on the EEG. We know that. So you have to be careful to not draw wrong conclusions. Number two, because these patients, as you saw, can move quite violently, oftentimes the EEG is unreadable during the episode. So you have to be careful. Maybe there is a nectal pattern under there, but you can't see it. So you have to be careful. And the bottom line is for us who do EEG video all day long every day, is to interpret both sides, the EEG and the video in the context of each other. We look at both and what one does and what the other one shows are intertwined incredibly. So we have to interpret them carefully and, and with the con with, in the context of each other. Other uh, traps that could lead into a wrong diagnosis, if the patient has more than one type of event, you can only conclude about the event you recorded. So if I record what I showed you on video and the family says, doc, that is not what she does at home. This is not, then I can't conclude about what I haven't seen. And like I mentioned before, an episode on video plus a negative EEG during the episode does not say psychogenic. It says non-epileptic, it doesn't say psychogenic. Can we say psychogenic? Yes, but it's based on things other than the EEG. So there is a difference between non-epileptic and psychogenic. In other words, psychogenic is a subtype of non-epileptic. Here are a few examples of things that are not epileptic but are not psychogenic. What's your name? This is an elderly guy. 
who has episodes like this where he can't talk. So he follows command, but he can't say anything. This lasts about 20 minutes. Obviously, he's in the seizure unit because somebody thought it might be a seizure, and that is a TIA. So this is to show the point that not everything that's not a seizure is necessarily psychogenic. Here's another one. She has facial twitching like this. The EEG is completely normal. So is this a simple partial seizure, which, by the way, may not show on the EEG. We know that. But it's not. That's hemifacial spasm. And we know that because they don't look the same on the video. The seizure usually affects the mouth, the lower face, not the upper face. That's blepharospasm or hemifacial spasm. My point in showing this is that non-epileptic and psychogenic are not synonymous. In reality, it's true. Most patients who come to an epilepsy center who are found to have non-epileptic things are psychogenic. But it's not always, and you have to be careful. Just non-epileptic does not equal psychogenic. There are other things. I just showed you two. There are more. So psychogenic uh, symptoms in general now, psychogenic symptoms are not limited to neurology or epilepsy. All these are symptoms in neurology that can be psychogenic. Paralysis, mutism, blindness, loss, loss of memory. What about subjective symptoms, dizziness, movement disorder, tremors, imbalance? Those can be psychogenic. They are not as common as psychogenic seizures and they are not as commonly written about because they are so hard to prove that they exist. Second to psychogenic seizures, if you search Medline or PubMed, the second most common neurologic symptoms, or symptom for that matter, not even just neurologic, that you will find after seizures is movement disorders. So movement disorder neurologists, movement disorder specialists, they deal with this on a regular basis, just like we do in epilepsy. And what they see commonly are psychogenic tremors, psychogenic myoclonus, and psychogenic gait disorder. So that's, if you, put the, the, if you put in PubMed the word psychogenic, most of what you will find is psychogenic seizures. The second, distant second, will be psychogenic gait, psychogenic tremor, psychogenic dystonia, etc. And movement disorder, people are quite good at identifying this. They don't have the equivalent of the EEG, but they do have EMG, which shows the pattern of muscle contraction and can really help. So in movement disorders, they classify them into definite, clinically established, and probable. So it's a little bit more difficult than with the EEG video, but it is feasible. And most movement disorder specialists do this. Psychogenic symptoms, like I said, are everywhere. There is something called psychogenic pseudostroke where people present with a hemiplegia or hemiparesis, normal imaging, not a stroke, and it can be absolutely psychogenic. The challenge here, of course, is that this is acute. They are in the ER and the, the, the doc there has to decide whether or not to give them TPA. So that's the discussion in this article. How about outside of neurology? Every specialist has their equivalent of psychogenic seizures. I'm listing some here randomly by specialty. But again, the problem is it's hard to diagnose. To prove psychogenic chest pain, for example, which is very common, is impossible. And in fact, nobody bothers to do it. They just call it non-cardiac or musculoskeletal chest pain. All they want to know is that it's not a heart attack. Uh, in pulmonary shortness of breath or cough, in ENT, globus, dysphonia, you see examples here, but it depends by specialty how they make that diagnosis. But most of the time, unfortunately, it is just a diagnosis of exclusion, which means if you are, let's say, a pulmonologist and you are suspecting psychogenic cough, which does exist, you have to do every test available, chest x-ray, chest CT, bronchoscopy, uh, spirometry, everything, and if you find nothing, then you say, oh, maybe it's psychogenic, but you're not, they're not that confident about it. That's what sets seizures aside. We can make that diagnosis. So here are a few examples in the literature, deafness, urinary retention, cough, dermatology, voice disorders are very common. Stuttering, mutism is more often psychogenic than organic. And this is what I was mentioning, the degree of certainty, the ability to make the diagnosis is what differentiates various symptoms. In epilepsy with the EEG video, it's only as good as who interprets it, of course, but experienced epilepsy center can make that diagnosis nearly with 100% confidence. Second to that, psychogenic movement disorders. They're very good, it's published, there are lots of studies on how to differentiate organic tremor versus psychogenic tremor, et cetera. 
For others, though, as I just said, it is basically a diagnosis of elimination, which means the patient has to have the million dollar workup. Oftentimes they get a second opinion, go to the big institution who repeats everything, every test, um, and then they find nothing. And then they say, well, you know, find anything, we think maybe it's psychogenic, but that's a weak strategy and that's the best we can do, unfortunately. So I like the field I am in because we can make a diagnosis of psychogenic episodes. Pain. So I said seizures is the most, not easiest, but the one we can diagnose with quasi certainty. The least provable psychogenic symptom is pain because pain by definition is subjective. There is nothing to see on video that somebody is in pain. It's an internal subjective sensation. So how do you prove it? You don't. You can't. And that's why they don't go into pain. But many people go into pain and they can deal with it. Uh, but this is so controversial that the psychogenic pain used to be a category in the DSM and I believe it was eliminated. Uh, so there is no longer a diagnosis of psychogenic pain. But here you have some examples of pain syndromes. This is not to say that all of these are psychogenic, of course. You can have organic headache and organic rectal pain and organic uh, other things. But to differentiate organicity and psychogenic symptoms when it's purely subjective like this, and of course the, the prototype of this is fibromyalgia, uh, is a real challenge uh, and... Um, is still controversial to this day. So my point is that psychogenic symptoms are not limited to the epilepsy specialist. You can substitute your word in here. If 30% of patients that come to an epilepsy center have psychogenic episodes, 30% of patients with refractory X, that's the key, key word. That means the symptoms are not responding to the conventional treatment. In, in the case of seizures, they're intractable. They don't respond to medications. Then, 30% of that group will turn out to have psychogenic symptoms. So what about the psychiatric and psychological aspect? So in the DSM, it belongs under categories. This is, of course, a psychiatric condition. So it is rightly in the DSM, with which I am sure you are familiar. In the old DSM, and by that I mean the DSM-4, uh, it was under a category called somatoform disorder, which was then divided into other categories, which I think I'm showing <laughs> in the next slide, maybe not. So somatoform disorder is a group that included conversion disorder, somatization disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, other things. But by definition, that group, somatoform disorder, means the patient is not faking, okay? They are not getting up in the morning with the intent of faking. It's a stress reaction. It's a way to deal with psychological trauma. By contrast, factitious disorder and malingering that you see here, those are conscious fakers. Those do get up in the morning and fake. They want to fool you and me. The difference between the two, in case it's not clear to you, is very clear in theory. Malingering is faking for reasons that you and I would understand. Money. Uh, voting a draft. Things like that. Factitious disorder, there is no understandable reason to you and me. That, that is a mental illness, whereas malingering is not a mental illness. So that's the distinction. By the way, somatic symptom uh, can occur in all kinds of other psychiatric categories, but they are not the main part of it. Whereas in these, the somatic symptoms define the psychiatric category. So this is possibly the most important message of today. When we say psychogenic, at least when I say psychogenic, I don't mean faking, and we should not. When I say psychogenic episodes all day long, I am not implying faking. The majority of these patients are not faking. They are traumatized. So it is by definition, this is the DSM-4 term, terminology, it's not under voluntary control. It's the category that was somatoform disorder. Now they're called somatic symptom disorder. The ones that are under voluntary control, they're intentionally faking, are factitious, otherwise known as Munchausen, and malingering, as we just discussed. So these were the five categories of the somatoform in the DSM-4. Like I said, this is now DSM-5. And as I said before, psychogenic pain no longer exists. I believe the other ones are still in there. 
hypochondriasis and so forth. Conversion disorder is still in there. Somatization is still there. So the category is named differently and does not have um, psychogenic pain, but it's basically the same. Here's the DSM-5. So they are under somatic symptom disorders. And that includes conversion disorder or functional neurological symptom disorders. And you can see here, as a matter of fact, it tells you what is gone in the uh, DSM-5. Hypochondriasis, I thought it was still there. Uh, and pain disorder, et cetera, that is gone. Whatever you call it, what they have in common is that this is a response to psychological stress. Now, when we say that to patients, say, doc, how can that be? I, I feel good, I'm relaxed. I don't mean that you have stress at 4.30 and you have a seizure at 4.45. That's not what it means. It means something happens back at some point in your life, something like these, abuse, rape, incest, and that's the way that it expresses itself. I am not an expert at this. We have people that are supposedly experts at this. They're called psychologists, and that's who should elicit this. In children, the stressors are usually more benign and they do better. So the outcome of this is tricky. They, it's not well known because a lot of people are lost to follow up, but it's a very big cost to society. Uh, with the proper diagnosis and the proper treatment, patients do well, but one of the most challenging parts of this is to get patients and families to accept the diagnosis. The prognosis factor that you see at the bottom here, the number one is the most important, recent diagnosis. If the patient's diagnosis was made after three months, six months, or one year of this, they will do well. If they come to me after 15 years of carrying the wrong diagnosis of seizures, they're not going to do well. The whole family dynamics are organized over the, the seizures, uh, around the seizures, so it, it's a real uh, tricky situation. And by the way, the delay in diagnosis currently is seven to 10 years before people get the right diagnosis of psychogenic episode. Other prognostic factor, no severe psychiatric pathology, premorbid functional status, and generally children and adolescents do better than adults, partly because it hasn't been going on as long. The seizures themselves in this situation are just a manifestation of the psychological trauma. So the goal is not just to eliminate the seizures, it's to address the underlying psychological uh, difficulties. The treatment is real tricky, but let me start by saying this is a psychiatric disease and it should be treated by psychiatrists and psychologists. The problem is they don't like this. Uh, the treatment of choice is psychotherapy and medications, and we now have evidence that it does work, uh, but we also have evidence that psychiatrists tend to be skeptical of this diagnosis and they don't believe it. So we have several studies now on CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and it does work. So that is the treatment of choice. Again, the problem is twofold. Get the patient and the family to believe the diagnosis and that's one side, and the other side is find a psychologist who is able and willing, not as easy as it sounds. The second leg of the treatment is pharmacotherapy, and there is excellent evidence that SSRIs work and help, so the combination of SSRI from this paper and CBT from the prior paper are the treatment of choice. There have been more now. There is evidence of um, other types of therapies, and most recently, by the way, even therapy by telemedicine, which is not surprising. I think every psychotherapy can be done by telemedicine. But there is a paper that was just published about telemedicine psychotherapy for psychogenic seizures. But you can see this is debated all the time. Once the diagnosis is made, we really need people to go into treatment, the two arms of treatment, pharmacotherapy and cognitive behavior therapy. As the neurologist, epileptologist, once we've made the diagnosis, our job does not quite end. You have to address, uh, you have to stop the seizure medications. You have to address the question, remember 10% also have epilepsy. You have to make sure the patient doesn't get another five MRIs and 26 EEGs so that the diagnosis is well documented. And you follow up just to show support and see that they're doing well. You also oftentimes have to address driving and disability because if they've carried a diagnosis of epilepsy for so long, those are big issues. Um, okay, so delivering the diagnosis is very important. This is not a condition that you can treat the patient if they don't buy into it. If they don't believe the diagnosis, they are not going to do the treatment. So the way to deliver the diagnosis is important. It has to be clear because most of the time we are sure. Most of the time it's not a mystery. 
And if so, it should be delivered firmly, compassionately remember that, remembering that the patients are not faking, um, but firmly, not, not give the impression, which is the impression patients often get as well, they didn't find anything, and so they said it was uh, psychological. No, we can make the diagnosis. These are psychological. It's not a diagnosis of exclusion, and it's not unclear, and it's not a rare disease that we can't find the cause. It's frequent, we know what this is, and this is what it is. The reactions in theory can be bad, but in reality, if you do it firmly and explain how you came to that conclusion, people react pretty well. I've only had a very small handful, less than five patients over 20 years of doing this, 25 years, uh, get really upset at the diagnosis and get up and leave. So it's very rare, usually, now you explain correctly and firmly, uh, it goes well. We have patient inf information material for this. It's very important, just like we do for other rare diseases. So we designed our own many years ago when I was in Cleveland. This is our current brochure. These are public domain on our website. You can get them and print them and give them to patients. Uh, I won't spend too much time over this, but I went to the American Psychiatric Association meeting many years in a row to see why I couldn't find patient information material on this. And you can see here at those meetings, this, this is a big psychiatric meeting. These are the numbers of sessions with these keywords. And when you put psychogenic, malingering, or factitious, practically nothing. I did it again in 2012. Search to see how much at these meetings, how much interest is there in this category of symptoms, and you can see the dismal results. So it's unfortunate, but the APAs, both APAs, American Psychological Association and American Psychiatric Association, have very little in the way of patient information for this category of disorders. I will admit that it has improved a little bit. This is the APA, the psychiatric one. They have nothing. Look at all these patient information and pamphlets, they have nothing here on psychogenic symptoms, nothing, zero. Uh, this is the other one. And finally, it has improved a little, I th oh, an update, here is the update, 2020. So this is up to 2012, they had nothing. Both, both APAs, nothing. So this is a paper that I wrote lamenting that there was nothing. And then the update in 2020, I went again, both APAs, and this time there is improvement. You can see here, this is the American Psychiatric Association. They added it, so they have some somatic, somatic symptom disorder, so it's under there. These are patient information materials. And under dissociative disorders, which this can legitimately be put under, so now it's a little bit better. It is still incredibly difficult to find a psychiatrist and a psychologist who believe this and are interested in helping. So, Psychogenic seizures and psychogenic symptoms in general are a big challenge in epilepsy, in neurology, and in medicine. In epilepsy, I showed you the red flags and how we arrive at the diagnosis. We can make a firm diagnosis, which is not the case in the rest of neurology and the rest of medicine. And unfortunately, in those situations, it is a diagnosis of exclusion where people have to get the million dollar workup and go for a second opinion, and it costs millions of dollars to society because we cannot prove that it's psychogenic and they feel obligated to do every test, which I understand. Induction and suggestion for psychogenic episodes can be useful. The treatment remains a challenge, not because it doesn't work. Psychotherapy and SSRIs do work, but you have two obstacles. One is convincing the patient and the family that they need this and that this is indeed psychological. And two, finding a psychiatrist and a psychologist that will believe the diagnosis and provide treatment. I cannot tell you how many emails I get every week because people find my name in articles asking me for where to go for treatment. And the answer is, I don't know. And I'm at a level four center and I have a special interest in this and I still can't give them a name, even in my area of a psychologist or a psychiatrist that's really good and interested in this. So there is a big deficiency and that's why the mental health organizations need to get out of their ostrich policy and be more cooperative dealing with this category of diseases. They, my impression is that they avoid it. That is my email address if you want any article that I showed. And now I am happy to answer questions or comments. Laura, I don't know if you want to take some from the chat or if people want to ask me live. 
I got one. So Lisa wants to know, what is the role of the school nurse? The role of the school nurse is very important because you're on the first line for this and you may well witness the episode. So the role, to answer your question, your role is to see if the episode looks like a seizure or does it have, of course, your first role is to keep the patient safe. That goes without saying. But after that is to observe the episode and see if it shows characteristics that look like a seizure or are suspicious. For example, are the episodes always triggered by getting upset, by giving the student bad news or things like that? So just observation and, and reporting to the doctor uh, what you saw, which will help us in making a diagnosis. So what Great. if the diagnosis has already been made? If we know that the student has the psychogenic seizures, you know, is there anything else that we can do other than just to keep the student safe when they're with us? Keep the patient safe and while you're at it, talk to the parents and make sure they understand the diagnosis and that they are providing the proper treatment. Great, thank you so much. Oh, is there special consideration with adolescents? Uh, not really, but it's a, it's a high risk group. It's an age, as you know, where they go through psychological stress and trauma. So they're, they're very much at risk at that age. So, of course, it's also an age where epilepsy is common. So, but yeah, they, they are particularly vulnerable to psychogenic episodes during adolescence. I see another question about the recovery period yep. following psychogenic events. That's completely variable. There is no rule. Unlike an epileptic seizure, if you have a grand mal seizure, you don't stop the seizure and get up and walk. That's impossible. So, in psychogenic seizures, it's much more variable. So that would be suspicious if it happened, but it can be exhausted at the end and it will wait because, before they recover. There's no rule, it can be anything. Um, They're a national list of providers, I wish. <laughs> no. It could be reached via telehealth if provider's not local. There is not even a list for local. And any inpatient clinics for newly diagnosed? No very almost none, but you know, hopefully things have improved as I showed. The APA now is starting to face reality and provide information. So I would consult with the APA and see that this may make progress now that we have good evidence that CBT works, but it, it is a challenge. Finding treatment is a challenge. And I, and I warn my patients, you know, it's nice for me to say you need CBT and you need an SSRI. SSRI I can prescribe until you see a psychiatrist, that's fine. But therapy, it's not easy to find a person that will do it. There is actually a, there is a, uh, an epileptologist in New York who is very interested in this and I'm forgetting her name now, um, but I can send you her name and she has a book. Yes, thank you, Lorna Myers. <laughs> They're on top of it. They are. Somebody else, and they said, can someone she have a real- a book. And it has a list. I don't know how often the list is updated, but she is super helpful. Um, she's at the Northeast Epilepsy Center in New York, something like that. Um, and yes, in her book, there is a database of providers, but hopefully it's updated often. Can someone have a real seizure after being upset? Everything is possible, but it's not very likely. If that is a pattern, yes, my seizure occur when I get upset. It's highly suspicious. Don points out that the Functional Neurological Disorder Society has also been doing webinars. Yes, I've heard of them and I am glad that it's becoming. But the problem with those webinars, as you know, including what we are doing now, is we preach to the choir. The people we need to come listen to this are psychiatrists and psychologists who don't believe it. Uh, do psychogenic events respond to medications, not to seizure medications, if that's what you mean? Seizure medications are for epileptic seizures. So no, they don't. They respond to SSRIs, as I said. How common is psychogenic seizures in kids under 10? Not very common, but it can happen. Not very common. The question is a good one. It's becoming more common in adolescents and then growing up. Young adults, adolescents, under the age of 10, not very likely. But they have other things that look like seizures that are not seizures. But do the seizures meds have a placebo effect? Any meds can have a placebo effect. Yes, sometimes yes, they can. So would uh, sugar pills and diuretics. 
But seizure meds also have side effects. So are you saying, um, just to clarify, that there is no medication for psychogenic seizures? SSRIs. SSS, okay. Antidepressants. Not seizure medication. They should not be on seizure medications. Correct. Do you think that there will be more um, doctors that eventually will expand into this? Is that the hope? That's the hope, oh. but I'm not very optimistic. There are a number of reasons First, psychiatrists are not all that interested that I showed by my numbers from the psychiatric meetings. Right. These are time-consuming, oftentimes difficult patients. Um, you know, a lot of psychiatrists don't have the time for this, and you need time for this. Um, and psychologists, and, and the other thing, of course, is that in, in the U.S., unfortunately, mental health is not reimbursed very well, and psychotherapy takes time. And so there are obstacles here. So if the, um, inside the school, um, if they are dealing with this, um, and, you know, obviously the ones that were on the presentation tonight obviously have a better understanding. If they take note that there is a, a child that has the psychogenic seizures, um, how do they deal with it if, either the parents aren't listening or they're not being diagnosed with it. What would be your advice for that? Well, the, the place to start is just a regular neurologist to determine if it is epileptic or psychogenic. Probably if, the, if psychogenic episodes are suspected, they will send them to an epilepsy center to have EEG video monitoring and record them. But don't forget also the role of cell phone videos. Very important. Take videos, bring them to this neurologist. It's very helpful for us to see those. Thank you, Laura and Trisha for doing this. And thank you and so much 